Right. We are carrying on with our adventures in food labeling, and today we are talking about dietary reference intake tables in Canada. And these are the tables that document the nutrition, uh, the, the nutrition quantity of different uh, micronutrients, vitamins, uh, macronutrients that we require in the daily diet. And it's based off of lots of epidemiology, um, various uh, dietitians, public health specialists, epidemiologists have established over many years of observation what is necessary for healthy living based off of, based off of all sorts of different studies. And based off of that, they have uh, made um, suggestions on what the diet should contain. And these dietary reference intake tables do frame much of the, uh, uh, the framework for nutrition facts tables and as such, it's important to understand what's going on behind them. Um, so let's just jump in here. At the end of this video, you'll be able to understand uh, the definitions used in the dietary reference intake tables in Canada and determine patterns in which the nutrients may have UL values or AMDR values. And it will be quite evident in a moment what these acronyms mean. But um, let's jump out here. And we are constantly referring to the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry as our textbooks of sorts for this section of the course. The Guide to Food Labeling for Industry is an immense resource and I always tell all of my students do go back to it time and time again as a primary resource. Even if you think you have memorized something, get into the habit of referring back to it and double checking, getting comfortable finding things quickly in there because it is a immensely important resource in Canada for labeling and it changes and so you want to be referring back to this document routinely because it's going to give you the most up-to-date information so I always joke that we are friends at this point and I'm just going to jump straight out because I have started a whiteboard for us so in the case of the dietary reference intake tables there are a couple key definitions that I want to just outlined for you. And we really have to think about the the context of this. We, if I, I always miss my whiteboard. And we have to imagine we've got a population of people here and we've got people of all sorts of different sizes and metabolisms. And some people are bigger and some people are smaller. Some people are rectangles. Some people have sticks for arms. But we've got all these different people of different sizes and shapes and metabolisms and different physiologic statuses. And if we really think about what this looks like, let's draw my wonderful bell curve here. We've got this line at the bottom, and it's going to talk about how much nutrient and it's increasing. If we think about the population now, inevitably in these tables, we're segmenting it out based off of a few different age brackets. Are you an infant? Are you a, a preschool toddler age? Are you a child? Are you a teenager? Are you male or female? Are you pregnant or uh, lactating? Are you postmenopausal? There, there are different age brackets where your nutrition changes, but and, and we do bracket those out in the tables, but in general, what we're seeing is, based off of all of this population dynamic, we're seeing this sort of bell curve type dynamic going on in terms of how much nutrient the population needs to be able to maintain good health. Now, let's jump into some of these different definitions. I'm going to uh, do EAR first, and I'm going to do it in red. So EAR is the estimated average requirement, and that is going to be as the name suggests, it's going to be the mean on this bell curve. So it's going to cover off 50% of the population. And so 50% at that level, at the EAR level, is going to have sufficient. And 50% is not going to quite have enough of that nutrient. But it is important to know what that threshold is for 50% of the population. Now, 
the AI value, the adequate intake, is very similar to the EAR value. Now, the EAR is defined through experimentation and through review of um, scientific literature, and the adequate intake is more of an approximation, but it's also in that 50% range, adequate intake, so 50% range. Now, let's jump to RDA, recommended dietary allowance. This one is slightly different in that what we're covering off is, we're covering off two, two um, standard deviations of the population, or it's approximately 97% of the population covered. That's a sigma, a sigma. And sigma just stands for uh, how many uh, standard deviations within that population. And so in the case of the RDA, we are covering off 97% of the population. And as such, the RDA is one of the more common values that helps define what those uh, values are on the nutrition facts table. Why? Because we're covering off virtually everyone within that population. Now, I'm going to go back to my black pen here and increase my axis out here a bit farther because this next value, the UL value, the upper limit, uh, I'm running out of markers. Should I use the rainbow marker? <laughs> Maybe. Let's use the rainbow marker just for fun. So the upper limit is where you start to see advert. Oh, that's, that's a pain in the rear end. <laughs> I, I want to be optimistic about my rainbow marker. That's where we start to see adverse effects. And so the tolerable upper intake limit is where in, in that um, continuum of how much nutrient uh, an individual may be consuming, for certain nutrients, for certain nutrients, you eat too much on a consistent basis and it can start to cause physiologic harm. Um, certain fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin D in particular, if you consume too much of that on a routine basis, it can start to cause harm to you. Same with certain minerals, iron or zinc or copper. If you consume far too much of that, it can start to cause a physiologic harm as well. And so certain nutrients will have an upper limit. Other nutrients do not. And Oftentimes, these are water-soluble vitamins, so you're going to um, excrete them out in your urine. And in other cases, they're going to be macronutrients that don't have upper limits because, again, that variation in the diet is, is quite routine. Now, in the case of macronutrients, I'm going to use my highlighter here. These are macronutrients. There's, there's this what's called the AMDR range or the acceptable macronutrient distribution range. And it's, it's sort of this, this tolerance that they will allow you to, I'm gonna highlight that in yellow, and I, my boxes aren't particularly accurate, but the idea being for AMDR is that you can have a range which is quite normal within the diet and that you're not fixated on trying to get a very discreet gram quantity or a very discrete uh, percent of calories contributed by a certain uh, percentage of, of, of the diet, that instead we're looking at a range that is typical and acceptable for the typical diet. And that AMDR range is giving a lot of leeway, knowing that here in Canada and here in North America, we're in general not lacking for macronutrients. It's some of the minor micronutrients that become problematic. Iron uh, in particular, uh, potassium uh, is problematic. Uh, calcium and vitamin D perhaps are limiting, but in general, we are not seeing huge amounts of nutrient deficiencies in, in Canada. So let's just jump out and take a look at some of these tables uh, quick, and I'll let you explore them on your own. Again, I don't want you to be fixated on trying to memorize the numbers in these tables. And um, why? Because 
honestly, they change. Every once in a while, the Institutes of Medicine, the National Academies of Science, um, scientists at Health Canada, they will come together and uh, discuss from a North American perspective, what should these reference tables look like? And every once in a while, they change. And that's okay. Uh, uh, something that we reflected on not that long ago, within the guidelines for um, the guidance for healthy eating in Canada, the the Canada's food guide, if you want to use that term, um, it wasn't that long ago uh, that these reference tables changed emphasis for which nutrients were important in the Canadian diet. And I realize that sounds weird. Like, what changed in our population? Well. Uh, the, the the nutrition facts tables had been reflecting vitamin A and vitamin C as as noteworthy micronutrients. However, the epidemiology said vitamin A and vitamin C in general are not limiting in the Canadian diet. And as such, perhaps more emphasis should be put on other nutrients such as potassium, calcium, and iron. So these do change. And that's why I want you to refer back to them time and time again, rather than trying to memorize the minor details within them. So let's just jump out. Let's, uh, I had done the elements earlier um, when I was reviewing the different content here, but um, let's jump out to the reference values for elements. So in general, we're looking at, um, in the case of elements, we're looking at minerals, as they're often also called. Some of these minor elements like boron, we have no established values in terms of nutritional requirement uh, for boron in infants, or actually, do we have boron requirements for anyone? No, we don't. We know it's important, but we don't know why, and we don't have an established limit. Calcium, there we go. We have a nutrient that has very well established requirements. In the case of infants, we're looking at 200 to 260 milligrams uh, RDA, and upper limit, 100 to, or not 100, 1,000 to 1,500, depending on that age bracket. Jumping up to some of these adult brackets, we're looking at uh, 3,000 in the teenage years for males, and then it tapers off into the senior years, because again, most of that bone deposition is occurring in the teenage years, and then um, declining because of uh, lessening uh, physical activity over t over time. Again, same in terms of female uh, for calcium deposition in bone, um, calcium increasing in pregnancy, and calcium increasing in lactation as well. So no big surprises here. But again, I want to just reinforce, I don't want you to memorize these tables. I want you to go back and refer to them consistently. Which of these nutrients have upper limits? Well, calcium has an upper limit. Why? Um, you start to have too much calcium in the diet or too much calcium from supplementation, and that calcium can start to deposit in uh, renal uh, calcification, renal calcification, and, uh, better known as kidney stones. Um, and so some of these nutrients do have these established upper limits. Um, let's jump it down. Iron's another good one. Reference uh, values for elements, iron. And so in the case of iron, we've got RDA values established. We've got upper limit values established as well for these nutrients. Uh, iron, as you know, is one of the micronutrients that is um, the most limiting in the global diet. Um, and as such, there is concern for iron deficiency anemia. And you'll see that females have a much higher iron requirement because iron is lost during menstruation and that Iron requirement uh, goes back and parallels the uh, the male population at eight milligrams per day when uh, women hit menopause because the menstrual losses of of, uh, of iron within uh, the blood are eliminated on uh, menopause, and so we do have upper limits for iron because if you have too much iron accumulation within the body, that can start to um, evidence itself as hemosiderosis and hemochromatosis, just too much iron accumulation. Now that said, most iron is um, minimally available and uh, the regulatory systems for uh, uptake of iron in normal population down-regulate when the iron status is, is good. So 
it's kind of interesting to just take a look at all of these different nutrients and think about which of these ones have upper limits. And an upper limit implies that there's toxicity and there's the potential for um, overexposure within the diet. Um, main thing is I want you to uh, know that these tables are here and know that you can refer back to them at any point in time. Let's jump into the macronutrients just for some fun here. Um, macronutrients, total protein per day. Interesting, it's per ki uh, grams per kilogram per day, and it's implied that it's based off of your, your uh, weight. So if you were to weigh, I don't know, let's say an infant weighs a uh, seven-month to 12-month infant weighing, I don't know, 10 kilos, you would estimate 12 grams of protein, not 1.2 grams, but 1.2 grams per kilo per day, and that's kilo body weight. Um, and so while you may be looking at these protein values and say, wait a second, I may be a young adult male. Why is it 0 0.08 milligram or uh, 0.08 grams of protein? It's per kilogram of your body weight. So if you weighed, I don't know, let's say you are a larger, a larger man and you weigh 100 kilos, you would need to have 0.8 times 100 would be 80 grams of protein. And that's on a per kilo per day. But then it, what's interesting is that if you go to RDA values, RDA values are much lower than that. And why? It's because it's making an estimate based off of an average person's weight at a pro I'm going to guess. Let's jump out here and see what this average person weighs. Um, No, they don't weigh 56 divided by 0.8. How much does this average person weigh? 70 kilos. Make sense? And so that they have established what that average male size is going to be. And that average male, according to them, is going to be 70, yeah, 70 kilos. Let's do the same for women. What, what do they determine that average woman to be? 46 divided by 0.8 equals so the average woman is going to be weighing 57.5 kilos just under 60 kilos and they've established those protein values based off of that now you'll note on most of these macronutrients there is no upper limit defined and again no upper limit defined on fiber no upper limit defined on most of these different nutrients um Alpha linolenic acid is omega-3 fatty acid, and that's a fun one because we do establish some um, adequate intakes for those nutrients, but no upper limit on those as well. All right, I think that's enough for me. Um, these, these reference intakes are important. Again, I don't want you to fuss about memorizing them. I want you to know that they are there and that they help frame the nutrition facts tables that we as product developers use on a consistent basis. We will be starting to explore health claims and how these are established within the Food and Drugs Regulation in our next lecture. So I look forward to seeing you then. Take care, ask good questions, and we'll talk to you again soon.